This is the latest of our series running down Georgia's top returning players based off of PFF grades. That's Brent Rollins. I'm Dane Young. We co-author Film Don't Lie over at UGASports.com. But in the offseason, we take a look back at the season that was and then which players made it in this case where Georgia could win a national championship. This particular feature that we're doing right now is a special one. If you're a Hollywood writer, if you love the – uh, kind of zero to hero story. This is for you because this week, Brent, right now, there's multiple in a week, but in this episode, William Poole, defensive back, as you mentioned just before we started recording, sixth year coming up at Georgia. Uh, and as we'll see once we get to our uh, film study on this one, this guy had his worst and best game against the same team just a few weeks apart with championships on the line. It's an amazing story. And especially the part when you think about, hey, who's going to be the highest graded defender in the national championship when you beat Alabama? How many names do you get to before this guy's name get men gets mentioned? Because that's what he was. He was the highest graded defender in the national championship. But I think the biggest thing for, like you said, the zero to hero part, he played more snaps in the last five games than he played in the previous four seasons. That's just amazing to think that a guy that was that important on the national uh, stretch, stretch run of a national championship season, and that was the, in terms of the snap count numbers. Interesting enough, he signed with Georgia uh, in April of 2016. Um, that's Kirby Smart's first spring. Yes. <laughs> I just wanted to let a little, little space sit there with that. Yeah, let that breathe. Yes, because like this is a foundational piece of the program in terms of recruiting, like the early buy-ins. And I'm not saying that he was a piece of 2017 when Georgia gets to the national championship, but man, we'll see a piece of 2021 when Georgia wins the national championship as a recruit, uh, 6'1", 175 pounds, uh, four-star out of Hapeville Charter High School in Atlanta. When you look at the recruiting profile, uh, pretty much anyone that was anybody in the SEC wanted him, including Alabama. Uh, and then when you look at him, like I said, 6'1", 175. And when we take a look at what Georgia Dogs, the official team online bio has him at, that is six foot 190. So that's about what he plays at, but, but he's a physical player, Brent. Yeah, and that's it's one of those where – Every time he would play, even me personally, just watching him in the little bit of snaps that he'd get, be like, okay, why don't we see a little more of that? Just thought I'm just curious why. And it was all, you know, when you think about what Georgia's had over the past few years, specifically drafted in the secondary, guys like Mark Webb, you know, Tyree Stevenson that is now on another team, but super, supremely talented players. And, you know, the biggest thing with this is, and just as a reminder to folks that when you look at this, this is our list as this, as it scrolls across the ticker. This is based on their returning PFF, the high in terms of grades of PFF grade, because someone will say, Hey, why do you have Keely Ringo below William Poole? This is not a best. This is not a most important. This is just based upon their play last year. And what you see, he only had 273 snaps. Ringo played almost 800 snaps. So There's a lot more sample size for Ringo to grade to fluctuate versus what Poole had in the last, those last little bit of games. That's a fantastic point, and, and we should remind people this list, again, is not based on our opinions of who we think the best players are at Georgia. Uh, it's, may, it, it's solely how every single play is graded by PFF, and you mentioned sample size being a massive piece of that, uh, and, and William Poole overall was a solid player. I mean, a, an above-average good player in, in the SEC. That's kind of the range that we're at here. We don't project him to be some fantastic piece, some future first round NFL pick or anything like that. Is it possible? Sure. Like that happens all the time in sports, but we don't project him that way like we do a Ringo. Correct. And that's, but I will say his return is vital for this team. That experience, him, Christopher Smith in the secondary, that those two guys returning, big deal for this upcoming season uh, in 2022. Uh, I didn't confirm before we started recording. I like to do that, that you can see who I have circled. Uh, you seen Nicobe Dean there, right? I've I seen Nicobe Dean. And who I don't see on this play right now is William Poole. Yeah, he's kind of hanging out over here to the right side. You'll see him once he gets started. 
Uh, and again, this is SEC championship. And this was a game that he wanted to forget. And frankly, he couldn't for about six weeks because I would say anyone that was a Georgia fan uh, did not like the name William Poole after this game. Well, especially when you think about his just being in this game. And this is the thir- this is the drive before the end of the half, third and 12, and he loses and we get Mechie lost wide open. And you can see him to the right of the screen uh, on this play specifically right there. Boom, looking, he's looking inside, and then the in-breaking route comes in. He moves off of that, leaves Mechie wide open. Obviously, there's no pressure for the most part uh, that's really forcing Bryce Young to get rid of it quicker. But, you know, th- this is one where, like you said, it's a game to forget. He played from a grading perspective. It was his lowest graded game. Eight catches on 10 targets, 97 yards, just – and without seeing him on the field much, and then all of a sudden he plays the majority of the snaps in this game where you know, we've seen Latavius Brinney for the most part uh, up until then, it was a head-scratching game, needless to say. Well, on this particular play, I'm going to pause it right here because – this is when, when the mistake is made. The mistake's first made with eyes, right? His eyes are back here rather than this player here. Would this be open if, if Poole sprints out here? Would this be an inside slant potentially? But, I mean, this is covered pretty well. Main thing I want to point out, though, is that if the coverage is right and the assignments are right here, you have N'Kobe Dean and you have Channing Tindall with one blocker in front of Bryce Young. Yeah, and, and it's, it, it's sort of safe to assume, I think, that Poole – messed up the coverage here and because you look at Ringo, you look at uh, the other backer in the middle, or whoever's in the middle of the field there, couldn't see real quick, but yeah, their back is turned the, on the outside. We're in true man that's seen in the middle. So, yeah. but you know, all of those guys on the underneath levels are glued. Thus it's, you know, kind of a two man type coverage and he's the one who doesn't, he tries to jump the route and loses Mechie. Let's kind of remind people that, why William Poole was preferred in some situations over Latavius Brini, who had played the majority of the season. And it was simply that Latavius Brini was, I would say, better in run coverage and helping against the run. But if you were looking for pass coverage and someone that could kind of lock onto a receiver, William Poole just does that better than Latavius Brini. Yeah, and it's, it's also the opponent. When you think about the opponent and what, what Alabama, the challenge that Alabama, Alabama presented with Mechie and Williams – and just more of a pass happy offense. Greeny was that. He was the more physical of the two. And, and you know, we see in the SEC championship game, all right, uh, maybe not necessarily as you know, there's a reason why the Greeny was sort of the fit, the more physical of the two when you see this this play here. Yeah, nothing complex for me to draw here other than um Alabama's gonna block here against him and then and he's gonna him. end up and he's gonna end up in a not good spot. Boom. I.e. on the ground. Yeah. Uh, so, and that's when you think about Georgia in that star position, the, the nickelback, the, the fifth defensive back, they always have to be physical. And the way Georgia play, they, they rarely get beat on bubble screens like this because of how well uh, the star position plays and how physical and leverage, all the things that you know, we constantly harp on here. It just wasn't there in this game. I mean, and this is just as simple as, uh, having to think a little bit too much. His, his head was kind of looking this way and the block was being engaged. You have to thrust forward and, and kind of push back, block before yep. it gets there, uh, and at least try to control the spot on the field. Yep, and it's that and Kendrick's chasing from the whole other side of the field. Just all in all, bad game. But the beautiful part about it, zero to hero. Like you saw it in the Michigan game, played very solid in the Michigan game, didn't miss a tackle. And here we get we're a little more physical. We're edge setting, we're keeping outside leverage, and then going and making a play. Yeah, the outside leverage was was clutching its mission. Keep everything as close to Jordan Davis and Trayvon Walker as you can. Yeah, because you were physically dominating that front, that game in the interior. Anything, you couldn't get beat in the outside. They did it once or twice. Uh, I know DK got beat once deep, but outside of that, they handled that game. You know, and that was, again, you see that what, a month later, less than a month, less than a month, right? Less than a month later against Michigan, playing much better, and then it sort of peaks uh, in this game here. All right, so you saw the flaws against Alabama. Now we flip to Alabama National Championship where I'm not going to come out and just say that Georgia doesn't win that game if William Poole doesn't play like he does, but it's a lot harder if 
you don't have his production in there. He was no. fantastic in the national championship. Yep, and this is one where this is the first the first play is the first drive of the game. Trayvon misses the snack sack again on on Bryce, and Bryce throws a very good ball just a little behind uh, of uh, Billingsley, but Poole is glued to him and makes a play on the ball, and this is the best angle to see. Great coverage, turns and runs, and then at the catch point, very physical at the catch point. You know, you they he gets that jump ball where he has a definitive size advantage, and now Alabama's first and goal on the first drive of the game. That's not good. This was a big time play early on in the game. He just stays with him. I mean, this is Georgia teaches us, right? Like, keep your eyes on, on the receiver and be willing to kind of put your hands up in the air um, yep. and see if you can just swat the ball that way. I think that's going to that's going to be interesting to see how this this upcoming season, because when you look back at twenty twenty one, how or yeah, 2020, sorry, 2020, how much man they played with Stokes and Campbell, and they didn't really make a ton of plays on the ball. Whereas in 2021 and then in the playoffs and national championship, tons of plays on the football, more zone, different secondary coach, obviously, with the die. Now this year, again, different secondary coach uh, with Fran Brown. How much do they keep making plays on the ball? Because it was, it was a, especially in this game, uh, phenomenal. Two things to point out on this play against Alabama pre-snap. One, obviously, is that when you have the motion man, someone's got to go with him in man coverage. That's William Poole here. Uh, but the also funny thing to me is that, uh, as was the case throughout the entire game, Kobe Dean, let's kind of bark at Channing Tindall, who may or may not be listening. <laughs> <laughs> sometimes he was, sometimes he wasn't. Uh, and hey, they made a lot of good plays together. But uh, Yes, they did. William Poole here. Yes, and, but – you know, we showed in that first in the SEC championship game physical. This is one where sees it and goes and gets it. Like that's just accelerating to the ball. Alabama trying to get Williams the ball quickly out on the edge, and he's just there. And then obviously, what do you see here? You see him running with Williams versus the previous game. You saw DK's you know, formationally a little different, but still making plays, making plays in space, making plays at the line of scrimmage, keeping outside contain, all the things that you want him to do uh, in this position. Yeah, the outside contain again, this is this is fantastic in the sense of like he didn't make a beautiful open field tackle, but he made it where there wasn't going to be no more progress because Channing Tindall was right there to help Christopher Smith and, uh, and Nolan Smith as well. Yep. Sticking with the third championship here. Yeah, last two. But another third down play with this here where, again, physical at the top of the route gives a very small window for Bryce to hit the throw. Bryce actually makes it, you know, makes the throw in the only spot that he can, but it's not enough for the first down. We're keeping our eyes right here. Yep. And it was obviously – And, you know, as the game went on – Bolden had to be that second guy with no, you know, and more, or really even first guy for the most part with no Matchy, no Williams. But again, Poole did his phenomenal job. Now, this is the this is the play that most remember. This is third and twelve, like seven ish minutes to go, I think, in the game. And what I want to talk about before this play is the second down play that many don't even know existed. Because on the second down, Georgia's in a man under, and he gets toasted on the bottom, sort of the bottom of the screen. And Bryce looked the other way. Bryce saw the matchup. Bryce went to the matchup at the top of the screen, didn't even look down at the bottom. So one play before, Poole is just absolutely gets torched, and it's a touchdown type play. And then he comes back and makes an absolute phenomenal play on, on third and 12. Which I, I mentioned that Tyndall thing in jest, but like that was kind of a theme in this game that like beat me once, fine, you're not going to get me twice. No, not at all. And this is when you watch this and watch him play this this ball. It's much like he did against in the opening drive against Billingsley. Just runs the route for Bolden here. We have multiple you angles of this one because it does yeah. get a little bit lost. Great pass. I mean, this is just this is teaching tape. Boom, physical a little bit. See it, run the route. Hand in front, just big time play. It's also situational awareness and knowing who you're playing against. Uh, Slade Bolton, good receiver, but this is not going to be some speed dimming that if you get behind me, that you know I, I can't catch up and you're going to get a big play out of this. Like you're trying to run something to get an angle. 
Yeah, and it's and the key here is at the top of the break, right there. He gives try he tries to get him leaning to the outside a little bit before he goes in breaking. And he didn't didn't fall for any of it. He stayed right with him, didn't get leaning one way, didn't get his body, kept his feet moving, and was able to get in and out of the break very fast and, and break up make the play on the ball. We'll Just one, one more look I'll at the see. whole thing. Yep. Just a phenomenal play from him. When you look at just game grades in general, SEC championship game, 49.8 overall grade, 47.6 grade in coverage, got torched for 87 yards on 8 of 10. National championship game, 80.9 overall grade, 82.8 in coverage. And now he did allow six catches on nine targets, but just for 29 yards and had this and the two big, big time pass breakups. Just phenomenal. Him going from somebody who literally didn't exist in in the rotation for the much for the better part of the season. He played before uh, week ten against Missouri. He'd only played five snaps against Auburn, and then against Missouri, played twenty one, and then thirty five, seventeen, sixty five, forty five, eighty five. Played eighty five snaps in the national championship game. Where do you project him for the team in twenty twenty two? Because he, he's the old guy in the room at this point got a lot of meaningful reps, but if you're just looking for straight-up athleticism and body size and all those things, there's some of these young guys coming in that will probably project better, but we know that Kirby Smart's really leaned on some of these, uh, I, I would say, more experienced guys like a Poole and a Smith. Yeah, and I think you initially, it, a lot of it, to me, actually depends on what what do you get, what are you going to get from Tyke Smith? Like, if you're going to get next-level play from Tyke Smith and he's back and fully healthy and looks great and all that sort of thing, he probably projects more in that star role, and maybe Poole was the more experienced guy who plays on the outside like we saw in the spring game. But what you have with him is just that. You have versatility that can play in inside in the slot or outside if need be, and that's – you know, you think about him, Christopher Smith, safety and or star, Tyke Smith, safety and or star. That might be sort of the hallmark of this secondary because in the past and in general – Kirby's like those got the corners play those spots, the stars are in that spot, the two safeties are there, like and they're in the game 90%, you know, 90 plus percent of the plays. They might have more rotation, more sort of freedom of movement with coverage, disguising, things like that, because of the versatility that those three guys offer. And because of that, it could be very matchup dependent, kind of like you were mm-hmm. saying that against the team like um, you know, in Auburn, Latavius Brini was very helpful just because of the way that they try to do a lot of their inside runs and uh, even Missouri with some of the, the pop passes and things like that. But against Alabama, you got to be able to, to, to cover because they're going to throw a ton of guys in the field and throw. And the beautiful part about all in the secondary this year is you have the dude. You have the absolute just likely going to be superstar shutdown corner on the other side with Keely Ringo. With him there – it allows you to be very, I think, I, I just, I think it's going to be a very unique secondary looks that we haven't seen as much of because of the versatility that some of these guys offer. Well, I, I think William Poole's proven that if you can perform on the stage that he did in the title game in Indianapolis, you have a spot somewhere on the field. And six years is a, is a long time to be at Georgia, uh, but he, he brings a lot to the team. And, and again, the story is just phenomenal with him. Uh, I'm eager for the day to come when his Georgia career is over and you kind of look back and say, look at what happened in his, at that point, six to seven years there. Uh, But like, that's going to be really cool to kind of look back on and and get his perspective uh, from being one of the first of the Kirby smart era to having won a title gone through the COVID year and all that stuff and come out on the other side with just like a ton of great stories for his future. So I'm excited to get to know him a little better. I hope Georgia puts him out to media that way. Um, and much like Ringo with pinks with the pick six, much like Stetson, he's another of these guys that are just now legendary figures for, for all time because of how yes. they performed in that one game. He'll never buy a burger uh, in the state of Georgia ever again, but he won't need to. Uh, uh, we, we still have to do that. Uh, so if you want to sponsor this, if you're a burger place, that's fine too. Hit, hit us up. Uh, Brent, enjoy doing this series with you where we break down Georgia's top returnees based off of PFF grades. William Poole does come in at number, what are we at, 15 with William Poole? So that means next we have uh, number 14. Coming up next. Got to keep watching. That's a keep tease. It was a poor watching. one. Yes. 
I, I, I was trying to do better TV teases. Thank you. You're, you're being very kind. Uh, we're going to wrap this up because I'm rambling. So uh, for Brent Rollins, I'm Dane Young. Hope you enjoyed this look at William Poole. Uh, make sure you are subscribed to our YouTube channel to continue getting all the great content that we put out. Uh, I mean, we've got, what, four staple shows per week at this point and then analysis on top of that. Uh, it's a lot of good stuff here over at UGASports.com. So make sure you're subscribed, especially as we get closer to the season. Uh, thanks for watching this episode. We will see you next time for number 14 of the top returning players from the Georgia Bulldogs, according to PFF Grades.